Okay, so people upstairs are hammering. There is a call there and there is a plane flying really close. I just, I just cannot. <laughs> I'm Roxy and this is Rock Me BS. Today I bring you a bit of a discussion video, something different, something I've wanted to do for the past few months, but I never made time for it and I thought now that we are wrapping up a wonderful Women in Translation Month, I thought what better time than this. Today I want to talk to you about diverse reading and the role in translation in it. Before we get into it, I just want to say this is not a read and it's not a criticism. People get very defensive online, I've seen it. Probably not the people that watch me, the people that I tend to interact with online are very, first of all, chill, but also very eclectic readers. A lot of them read more diversely than I do quite honestly, so it's not something targeted. These are things that I've thought for a long time, but also they've been condensed and sort of reinforced by thousands of posts and uh, articles and websites that I've visited and Twitter feeds, etc. In any case, diverse reading. Earlier this year, with the whole Black Lives Matter protests that erupted not only in the US, but all over the world, a lot of other related issues about systemic racism began to surface. And in publishing particularly, there were a lot of stuff about uh, advanced payments and publishing and discrimination. But there was also a bit of an upside with the fact that a lot of people rushed to buy a lot of anti-racist books, which I think is great. But then a lot of people began saying, hey, you can also read black authors for entertainment, not only education, they are also artists or entertainers. So check those out as well. And then people began to make all these read diversely lists. And then slowly that became not only black authors, but BIPOC people or people of color in general, which is, you know, most of the population except a very small number of people. And don't get me wrong, I think this is all amazing. I think these voices are very important because they are human voices, because they are stories, they are interesting stories, they are unique to them, but they can also be as universal as, you know, a German young romantic guy killing himself because of love. Hashtag relatable, I guess. And it's especially important to highlight these voices because they've been systemically and historically silenced. I get that. However, I have noticed that a lot of people, when they rush towards diverse shelves, tend to think about three types of diversity, racial, gender, and sexuality. Again, very important aspects of one's identity not gonna deny that. But I would like to encourage people to consider diversity beyond that. For example, age. Have you noticed how a lot of books and media in general center around kind of the same pockets of ages? Something to consider. Occupation, class, and perhaps most importantly, in my personal opinion, nationality. I don't think where you're born determines everything. However, I do think that nationality influences more the intersection of other factors than you think. So for example, being gay in Canada is not the same as being gay in Brazil. There are whole complete different experiences. And the same goes with race and class. Things that because we get so much influence from English speaking country, case in point, this channel is in English and I read mostly books in English, even when they are translated from other languages. So I get it. In the global landscape, we are confronted with a lot of cultural patterns that stem from the US and the UK. That's inevitable. But I think sometimes there is an expectation that people will know everything that's going on in the US and the UK and that they understand how issues of class and race and um, even age or sexuality operate in these countries, but not the other way around. And it is very different. Class, for example, it's a whole different issue here in Chile compared to the US. Race too, and I'm not saying we don't have similar problems, but they manifest in different ways because every country has a very specific history. Even 
when it is connected to other countries' history, if you see what I mean. In my particular case, I always see the same types of narratives being pushed forward in the US, i.e. Latin American identity, which are immigration narratives or narratives of uh, Chicano literature. Again, I'm not saying these narratives aren't important. I'm just saying that that creates certain expectation or certain ideas of what, for example, being from Latin America is that are not necessarily realistic or not necessarily the whole picture. I'm addressing this issue in particular, not only because it pertains me, but because on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, there was this discussion about what being Latin X means. Now that is a label that I think is very valid, but doesn't apply to me. I don't identify as Latin X because I think that's a very US thing. Some people who have been born and raised in the US told people in Argentina that they didn't have a right to define Latin American ship because they were white. And saying that to someone from Argentina is literally not understanding what Argentina is or what people in Argentina look like at all. I think that happens largely because when people reach for diverse books, they still look for things that are directly related to their country because there's so much of it. And again, it's so important, but it's not the only thing. The mere idea that people view their identities or construe their identities in the same way everywhere is ridiculous. There are individual experiences and then there are collective experiences, but even within a country, those are so different. So let alone the world. Where am I going with this? This is the role in translation and this is why translation is important because translation can help us counter these ideas or not even counter, just balance these ideas out by contrasting them. Ideally, we would be able to read every single book in their native language. I'm sorry, translators. <laughs> I think you're so important, but if I could, I would. But of course, that's impossible as far as we know now. So we need translation. But the problem is that even nowadays, translation is very biased and it's seen as something. And I want to delete that idea because most countries, I don't want to say every country, I don't know what every country is like, but most countries will have their own literary industry and they don't only produce literary fiction or experimental fiction, they also produce YA, romance, mysteries, and nonfiction. Nonfiction rarely gets picked up to be translated. People have this idea that all translated fiction is very artsy and it's very, to some extent, they have a point because what gets translated tends to be like that. Or a lot of times they repackage books that wouldn't be marketed as literary fiction in their original countries as literary fiction in order to cater to this idea that translated fiction is very sophisticated and inaccessible. But that's just another way of othering. In every country with a publishing industry, there are good things, bad things, things of different genres. And I think it's very important that we try to make an effort as consumers, as readers, to seek out more content from other places that are not even remotely related to us. Nowadays, that is getting trickier and trickier because globalization, we are all connected. But you know, the gist of this is applicable. The numbers have probably shifted and hopefully for the better. But five years ago, I went to the local most important book fair here in Santiago and they had this panel about publishing in different countries of both Americas. One of the speakers was, I think, a sales coordinator for a book chain in the US. And they said that approximately in the US, 300 books are published every single day, but out of the total of that, only 3% a month is translated fiction. Again, old numbers, so don't get fixated on that, but think about 3%. That's nothing. If I go to a bookstore now, I would probably be kicked out because we're in quarantine. But if I went and I could browse, I would guarantee you that over half of those books are translated fiction. And I'm being generous with the half. And if I go to the movies, if the theater is showing 10 movies, 
eight of them will have been originally in English and I'm not even joking. Now, that is a problem that concerns my country as well, it's a whole other issue about foreign influence, but that is just to illustrate how we all consume media and sometimes that normalizes certain identities over others. This is not new what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that reading diversely is not only a matter of race, it's not a matter of only gender, only sexuality. And one of the ways of accessing this is consuming more translated fiction. And eventually, hopefully, if more people become interested in translated fiction, publishers will become bolder and encouraged to take more risks Ari fiction. For example, in Spain there is a huge YA industry. They publish so much YA. Of course I'm not gonna read it, but I think it's admirable. It would be so cool if those works would get to be translated into English. Now of course I'm doing a very small part, this is a very small tunnel, and people that watch it again probably already are sold on translated fiction. But maybe you can show this to someone else. I don't know. Share. And if you're someone who is looking to get into translated fiction, don't feel a pressure to like it, don't feel a pressure to appreciate every single thing. Sometimes I see these posts of how to get into translated fiction or how to read from other cultures and a lot of people are very aggressive about it. I understand that comes from a lot of rage of having been marginalized and silenced, I get it, but it's not how you make people interested in things. I think at least. I don't think you need to get to the most niche complex writing, especially considering that it's translated and a lot is lost and gained through translation. After all, let's not forget, languages are yes related but they are also unique and they also encode a lot of information that's not in the words themselves or that is through interactions and through nuance and different layers of meaning. Just don't assume that because a lot of the same literature is translated from the same country, that is all the literature there is in that country. Although I think literature is a good indicator of cultural patterns, it's still art, it's not life. And you know, every individual experience is different. We all know this. Just enjoy it, don't feel guilty if you don't like it, or don't feel discouraged if you don't understand everything. That's very okay. That's why I'm such a big proponent of rereading, for example. And yeah, don't feel like you have to do all this research beforehand. There are maybe some things that would be useful for you, but maybe learn them afterwards and reread the book afterwards. Don't be afraid of DNFing a book and then after you learn the context, going back to it. You all know I've been getting a lot into Russian literature lately and that has sparked an interest in Russian history because through that I will probably understand the works better. But I don't feel like I need a PhD in Russian literature to enjoy it because after all we're all human and things that seem odd or behaviors that seem odd, I take note of and I think, oh, maybe that's how they do it or maybe it's also odd there and then I read other uh, Russian literature and see how those people behave. We are all people and we go through similar stuff and we also go through unique stuff and that is reflected in literature, I guess is my point. And pick up more translated fiction, that's, that's it, that's the video, that's the TLDR. Translated fiction is awesome and please consider that when you think about diversity and diverse reading. Originally this video was going to end with my recommendations for you to read Chilean and Latin American literature, however I thought that would be a little too long and I would like to go more in depth into these authors. I am not an expert by any means. Consider that instead of studying the equivalent of a Spanish major and Spanish literature and literature in Spanish, I studied English literature and translation and linguistics in English, but I do read some of it and I am trying to get back into it, so I will have some recommendations, it's just that I want to go a little bit more in depth and I also want to make sure that the works are translated and to give you some recommendations re the editions that you can find. So let me know if that would be interesting to you, I would be very interested in doing that. Please leave me your favorite 
author that writes in a language you don't understand. So if you speak like four languages, you have to find someone that is not from a language you speak. That's, that's the challenge. And if you do speak four languages, that's awesome. I'm so jealous. I hope you liked this video. It was a bit rambly. I tried to make it as succinct as possible and to the point as possible. I don't know if I succeeded, but you know, read in translation, read diversely, broaden your idea of what diversity is. It's okay to notice how things are different and it's also okay to notice how things are similar. That's basically life. We share some experiences, we have some pseudo unique experiences. A combination of those is our lives and then we die. So read, read. That's a good way of spending your life. Okay, if you like this video, please like it, subscribe and comment. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.